My topic today is GPM and TFP sequencing, integration, or both. So when we think about the two different treatments, it's, I think, useful uh, to get some background on the two. So GPM was developed by Generalist. It's based on APA guidelines. It aims to be used by a broad group of clinicians, and it has significant public health goals. So TFP would be different in, in its background. It was developed by psychoanalysts. <clears throat> It, it's, I think of it as an adjustment of standard psychoanalytic approach for specific treatments because those approaches didn't work. Um, and it's uh, initially a treatment for specialists. Public health goals, which um, are a, an area of interest uh, for me in terms of uh, introduction of what we call applied TFP, that followed later. But using TFP principles um, outside of uh, a, the individual psychotherapy. But the origins of the two treatments is very different, um, and the training is different. GPM is designed to be um, uh, very easily mastered with uh, training, initially accomplished in a weekend, and the handbook is accessible and uh, quite operationalized. Uh, TFP is different. It requires relatively intensive training that can last many months, and the manual is dense and can be very challenging. So the treatment, uh, you, um, as um, you may know GPM is a flexible schedule. Um, it's a mix of supportive, cognitive, and psychodynamic interventions with the focus as mentioned on interpersonal hypersensitivity. TFP is designed as a twice weekly, one to three year treatment. It has an object relations theoretical orientation with a focus on integration of split off elements, particularly aggression. So the design of the treatments are very different. Um, in terms of commonalities, um, both have an expectation for meaningful activity commitment. Uh, both um, uh, uh, would um, uh, expect the therapist to be active, so uh, very different from uh, the more uh, passive uh, traditional psychoanalytic psychotherapist uh, for TFP. Uh, both um, require an open discussion of the BPD diagnosis, as all the evidence-based treatments do, um, at, at the onset of treatment. Um, and both uh, include psychoeducation for the patient and family members. So there are a number of com based commonalities as well. So the question is, uh, with GPM and TFP, is it best thought of as sequencing, as uh, integration, or both? So sequencing, the most common would be uh, moving from a GPM uh, treatment done by a generalist to a TFP treatment done by a specialist. Um, Alternatively, uh, a GPM treatment could be part of preparation for TFP. For example, uh, a patient who has substance use disorder, mood disorder, eating disorder that require a preliminary uh, period of treatment before it would be reasonable to begin uh, a TFP treatment. Um, sometimes um, uh, it's useful to go from TFP to GPM when, for example, a patient cannot or will not agree to the TFP contract or there's specific uh, logistical challenges. Um, not every patient can um, um, fulfill the requirements of the TFP contract, and that the a clinician may feel that a GPM treatment would be appropriate in that circumstance. And then there's integration, which Patrick just um, talked about, and I would refer you to uh, the article. Um, the first author, author was uh, our colleague, Lois Choi Kane. Uh, and her description of te technical eclecticism, that article from 2016, in terms of, as Patrick was pointing out, using some of both theories. So the goals of the treatment are, essentially, are somewhat different. So um, the main goals of GPM, I think, could be summed up as avoiding iatrogenic complications, avoiding polypharmacy, unnecessary hospitalizations, um, useful and practical case management, and a focus on interpersonal hypersensitivity. TFP has different goals, uh, primarily the goal of uh, identity consolidation, the integration of what is split off, denied, or projected, exploration in the transference of role reversals, and that gets at Patrick's point about uh, integration of um, uh, aggression that's not fully in the patient's awareness that might um, emerge um, in, the, uh, in the transference and what would be described as exploration of the transference of defended against wishes, what we would call in TFP dyad defending against another dyad. So the goals are, are, are significantly different of the two treatments. 
In terms of the assessment process, that's pretty different too with GPM and TFP. Uh, with GPM, it's a standard psychiatric assessment with the exclusion of patients with co-occurring disorders that would preclude useful access to the treatment. But a GPM clinician could see a patient Monday and start the treatment Tuesday. That's not the case with a, with a TFP treatment. The assessment is more extended. It involves using the structural interview, which I think of as um, consistent with the um, hybrid model of a, a, a categorical and dimensional approach. Um, it's, uh, the assessment process will be focused at the outset on secondary gain of illness, as well as what would be common with GPM, the exclusion of patients with a co-occurring disorder that could preclude useful access to treatment. So for example, in TFP, the patient with an active substance, a significant active substance abuse problem or eating disorder, that patient might be referred to a, sp a treatment specific uh, for that disorder in the interim period before TFP treatment uh, could begin. So contracting is another uh, area of major difference between the two interventions. GPM has a flexible arrangement, what I would think of as ad hoc contracting. It has an openness to most um, adjunctive treatments and has an encouragement of meaningful activity. But I would say some flexibility with that, especially at the beginning. With TFP, the um, uh, contract is for twice weekly meetings. There's this detailed contracting process in advance of starting treatment. There's openness to some adjunctive treatments, uh, and in addition, the requirement for meaningful activity. But the assessment process and the contracting process will last much longer in a TFP treatment um, and so um, a, t a TFP clinician might not begin a therapy for a number of weeks, even months, um, which of course would be quite different from GPM, which is designed to be flexible and accommodating. So the technique, GPM could be described as a mix of supportive psychodynamic, CBT, and case management interventions, with as noted the focus on the centrality of interpersonal hypersensitivity. TFP has a requirement that the patient speak freely. It's um, uh, essentially based on uh, the idea of free association. That would not be the case, of course, with GPM. Uh, there'd be a, a particular focus on challenges, expectable challenges to the contract, and use of clarification, confrontation, and interpretation over time. So it's a very different um, a set of techniques. So in terms of different scenarios, um, uh, Patrick and um, uh, talked about a few, um, but um, in terms of sequencing, we can imagine a case, say, of Mr. A, who finds that he uh, benefits from a year of GPM, and his understanding of the role of hi interpersonal hypersensitivity has helped him lessen the chaos of his romantic life. But he'd like to make more progress in work, and his therapist believes TFP's focus on integration of split-off aggression could help Mr. A in his frequently contentious work uh, situations. So here you'd have a patient who's referred from GPM to TFP, not because GPM isn't working, but because it has worked and the patient has a different set of goals. So that would be one sequencing scenario uh, with these two treatments. Um, another would be Ms. B. She's had a limited uh, response to GPM. She's had a lessening of counterproductive polypharmacy and unnecessary hospitalizations, but her therapist thinks a more intensive treatment could be of benefit. Ms. B is referred to TFP in part because of its more detailed contract and rigorous frame. Um, again, uh, GPM has a relative flexibility. The TFP um, uh, frame can confer some benefits for patients who, for whatever reason, uh, don't respond um, to a GPM format. So another sequencing scenario would be Mr. C, who's referred to TFP, but after six months, his fragile narcissism has made a serious commitment to meaningful activity impossible. After extensive exploration, his therapist recommends a less intensive treatment. So in this case, we would have a TFP therapist refer referring a patient to a less structured treatment with, less, um, with um, different goals, Mr. C continues in a weekly therapy which is more consistent with a GPM approach. So let's talk about integration, as has been done. Dr. D works in a setting where she is not able to meet with a patient more frequently than once a week. She feels certain TFP elements, such as a focus in the assessment process on secondary gain, 
in a more detailed uh, treatment contract can add a dimension to the GPM treatment she is providing. We might think of this as, a, um, as a, an applied TFP, using TFP principles like exploration of secondary gain at the outset, like focus on a more detailed contract in a, a, a different modality, not a standard TFP twice weekly psychotherapy. Another integration um, um, scenario would be Dr. E, who's trained in TFP and finds that using elements of GPM is useful in, um, in his approach to pharmaco pharmacotherapy. So for example, Dr. E invokes the GPM tenets of uh, prescribing, which could include use of uh, SSRI for alliance building if indicated, a focus on identif identifiable target symptom goals for use of any new medication, and a delay in uh, adding additional medications in crisis. Um, the, um, uh, the GPM approach to pharmacotherapy is very detailed and uh, useful and has elements that um, could uh, be of, of use to a, a clinician uh, um, doing a, um, a TFP treatment. So that's the presentation, and I guess we'll go to questions for everybody now. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I know each of these individuals, but I have to say I was, um, so, I was so impressed with the quality and the depth of these presentations. Uh, um, I'd like to turn it open for people to ask questions of uh, these three gentlemen, and I, I guess I can feel them, but you guys, uh, yes, Joel. I, I have a question for you, though. Do you have a, Do you have anything provocative that you might want to share? With us? <laughs> <laughs> don't Don't hold back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Brandon. Uh, I think my only response is um, how How then do we learn? How does, as an individual clinician, um, let's say someone who isn't tied into the research community, maybe who ought to be, um, how how, do, how should our trainees try out different approaches, different techniques? I guess it's a question back to you. Where do they start? Um, I think that's one way in which the, uh, the signifiers remain useful, just to, as evidence that there are different approaches, and some of them have gone by these names. And look, when you try this one, actually, it, it requires a different thing of you as a clinician. It requires a different thing of the patient. It may get you a different result. It gives you sort of bridges to jump off of with the patient and see how it goes. But how else would, 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 you, would you do it? I think having different theories is a problem as long as you think one has to win over the others. If you see that there are different things and there's value in difference, I don't see the problem. So I, I have one 
guys comment about that too. I, I, th I think that um, you know the, the the field has been hurt by uh, sticking to these uh, three letter. Uh, treatments, but it's also been helped immensely. And the field was at a place where it was adrift until these treatments came into place. But if we hold on to them for too long, it will really hurt us. And so I think the kind of thinking uh, that Brandon, Patrick, and Richard sort of exemplified, and that I think you exemplify back in Montreal, which by the way, I noticed you used three letters in describing to your students uh, how you work. Um, you know, is, is, is where we're at. And this is what we're advocating, is sort of getting beyond the alphabet soup and uh, being nuanced and reflective and thoughtful about how these approaches, which I do believe help the field immensely, but we're now sort of at the point where it's starting to hurt the field. And I, yeah. I know for me, um, your work uh, is always in the back of my mind when I was learning <laughs> TFP, because I thought to myself, this is a very rarefied treatment, right? twice weekly, one to three years. But the concepts were so useful in our general um, psychiatry clinic for second year residents that um, they're, they're, it's helpful to have that training that can then be applied uh, um, in a situation where we're not offering uh, that, that treatment with the same goals. But we have in mind what you describe so often as the public health need that, that, and different kinds of patients need different things. Maybe some patients can get uh, DBT skills and that's enough, but there are other patients, for example, with um, more, we would call narcissistic and antisocial traits who need uh, to be approached in a different way and um, uh, T applied TFP has a utility there um, that's, uh, I, I think, um, you know, not, not offered maybe in, in, in some other treatments. So I think you can, you, can, um, you can do both. You can be really flexible, and you can also um, use certain uh, principles that um, are experienced near, that are clinically useful. So that, that would be how I think about, um, uh, about using these. Uh, I have to keep it concise. I think, you know, you and I know each other, Brad. Um, well, what I also would have said to, to Joel Paris is that um, I think each of these treatments, trying them on and seeing what they tie together about the room, what they, you know, has e that act has unlocked something within me. You know, it sort of allowed me to tap different aspects of myself. And it's, you know, maybe I would have learned it all if these things hadn't gone uh, by DBT or TFP or GPM, you know, maybe just, you know, here's contingency management, here's interpretation of object relations, here's naming the players, here's getting a life and focusing on treatments. I think for me it's been very trial and error. And then I think I was, I was trying to speak to that in my talk, that very subjective quality of where you feel like something locks in and it manifests both as improvement in the patient's life and you feel like there's something relational that's genuine, that's uh, moving something forward. I, I, that's the thing I was, the, the sort of ineffable quality I, I, I was trying to, I guess, leave ineffable. I don't know that I answered your question. <laughs> point is well taken about um, the analogy to what was going on in the 70s and 80s with regard to different psychoanalytic theories. Uh, Valerie. way for a patient or a family to evaluate what they were getting, how they were getting it, or if they were getting it, and so 
or anything. So that has been a disaster, which is still going on. The other side of it is um, when Marsha Linnea, when I first met her in 1993, I was unaware that she had developed like, a tank, a rollout method for um, dissemination that it's, it, she like branded it and she got it out there and she had training teams. And when I look back at it, it's kind of extraordinary. So we do referrals in my organization. Well, tell me who I'm referring to for mentalization. It's wonderful treatment. So I sent people to McLean and to Menninger and I don't know where else. There's no clinic with mentalization. You do trainings, but I don't have a listing of these people. Now, in TFP, what I see is firstly, it's terrific, but who can afford it? And the people who seem to go to TFP are highly motivated to get better. People who go to DBT sort of get thrown in by the family, or it's the thing to do, or they get sent there. So I think there's big disparities here in what's available for the public, what choices the public has, and how do you determine who to get what? Because in New York City, I don't know where to send these people to, other than the DBT. Yeah. So um, a, a couple of thoughts uh, based on what you were saying. One is um, uh, that we're at risk of actually using another three-letter treatment if we don't actually uh, invest in these kind of treatments. It's called treatment as usual, or TAU. Um, and, and that's often very subpar, not always necessarily, but often. Um, I also think it's important not to, that, that I think there are some trends that cut across our country here and, and that might be different in other countries in terms of what's available. But, you know, for instance, um, you know, in State College in the central Pennsylvania, we have a clinic where we do TFP and most of our clients aren't highly motivated. They're not your New York City uh, type of TFP client, uh, e you know, either in terms of wealth or in terms of uh, motivation. So we're treating very different. And I think there are those regional differences uh, based on idiosyncratic placement of people um, and I think what you're saying is there's not enough people uh, in general uh, for this, and I think that's one of the impetuses behind uh, John Gunderson's uh, uh, and, and Joel's model. Um, and I think they are great, and I think that's what, you know, the purpose of this panel in part is to be encouraging to people to think about cross-training in this way. I mean, I guess we cross-train and exercise and stuff like that, not necessarily me personally, but... Um, uh, but um, but we, could, but I do cross train, I guess, in psychotherapy, um, uh, and, and these guys are uh, uh, triathletes here. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, and that 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 you know, your point is well taken. But I think that you know, the idea is that uh, we do have to sort of move the field forward to sort of an acceptance of multiple models. Uh, I think John Gunderson's doing a great job of. Uh, it's a different model than Marsh's for dissemination. But I think it's an inspiring, highly effective model, and, uh, and TFP and MBT um, could learn from that potentially, although as people pointed out, TFP is a different learning process. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you want to take a stab at uh, Valerie's question or if there's another question that people might have. Yes? So I'm going to repeat the question in case people didn't uh, uh, hear. Uh, the question is mainly around um, does setting contribute to choice points in thinking about which of these treatments one might use? And uh, despite the fact that you guys are sitting so close to one another, I'm going to ask if, if you guys answer this to, to come up and use the microphone for people. I just go first, and I want to hear what these two say as well. But I think um, p part of my 10 years has been uh, constantly involved in group therapies of different kinds as well, since primarily my practice is hospital-based. 
I do run a private practice as well and, and tend to refer, I think, more than many of my colleagues to groups. I, I generally want my patients in groups. Now, that's not required in TFP. Um, I, 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 this is anecdotal. I, I have found that, um, so, so one of my hats is I run the MBT clinic at McLean where we are trying to really implement uh, adherence, you know, MBT treatment, which is e values equally the individual and the group component. Uh, just anecdotally from the little bit of data that we have, people do do better when they're in both. I mean, that's a, that's a general trend that we see. We haven't published it, but um, we notice it anecdotally, and hopefully we will at some point publish it. Um, I, maybe what the TFP folks would say about the, the setting and the relevance of individual versus group, but all the other models emphasize that both are really uh, change-oriented. There's, there's relatively uh, limited uh, writing on group TFP. There's some. Um, my uh, understanding is that in certain parts of Western Europe, um, there's more focus on, um, on TFP in all kinds of situations, hospital-based, uh, outpatient groups. Um, but it's, um, again, it's not like uh, DBT or MBT where uh, the, um, uh, the group is built in, uh, you know, group activity is built in. Um, you know, but but the, the one point, if you remember where TFP came from, you know, that's from the old psychoanalytic dyad. So just the idea that there would be adjunctive uh, interventions at all um, is, is uh, an advance uh, from in the past 25 years. So, as somebody who was on internship uh, and participated in TFP groups at that time, um, I will say that uh, I've thought a lot about this. There has been very little writing about TFPs in, in groups. My sense is Otto is not against the idea at all. Uh, he actually um, has a, a number of theorists that talk about groups that he's interested in. I think it's been a person power situation in terms of focus. But I've actually thought, do, do our patients need a TFP group or do they need an MBT or a DBT group instead? I'm not sure that, uh, that, I, that I think that they necessarily need more of TFP in a group situation. They might. I mean, somebody could debate me on that, and if Otto was here, I, he might. Um, but I have thought that going to a DBT group or an MBT group is not necessarily antithetical to being in TFP treatment, and that that could be a useful uh, adjunct or, or, or support. And so. Um, uh, it's just, it really hasn't necessarily been a, f a, f a focus, but it, it may need to become one. But it's a good question. What, what is a group like that? What is a TFP group? Um, well, it's a, it's a group that uh, probably looks, <laughs> I was going to say it's a, it's a hot mess. No, uh, no, it's a, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group that might look like an, a regular psychodynamic group, except it's more integrative in terms of using TFP principles. And so, um, uh, to me, to be honest with you, it, 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 it felt like, you know, another, um, you know, another dose, but it was kind of, it felt like a, a diluted dose. And, and, and I had thought, you know, over the years that might, what might be a better dose for the patient is getting some skills-based training. And again, it's not antithetical to a TFP approach, uh, and we do this all the time. Uh, actually, um, I don't find TFP to be uh, uh, that uh, resistant to adjunctive approaches, although uh, some of my students who are sitting in the room might say they might experience me more that way because we're tr I'm trying to teach TFP and, 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 and do research in, on TFP in the clinic. But, um, but I do think that uh, it, it does do it well. In fact, I think it does that better than, uh, you know, somebody doing a skills group being, uh, b b you know, depending on their rigidity to the approach of DBT, being open to taking someone in an individual TFP uh, treatment. Uh, and of course, you know, when you have that, then you can certainly do that. There's a study out of MGH where they looked at people in DBT at MGH in the individual psychotherapy uh, and the groups compared to people who were in DBT groups at MGH but in a different psychotherapy, typically psychodynamic, versus people in MGH groups in psychotherapy outside of MGH. And there was no differences between the people treated at MGH, whether they were in DBT or psychoanalytic individual therapy, but there were differences compared to uh, the people outside of the system. And of course, it's, you know, it, make, it makes sense at some level, you know, the, being in system was integrated. 
But at the other hand, it's also proof of concept that you don't have to be in a, with a DBT therapist to be in a DBT skills group and find benefit. But that's the, the data suggests that the DBT group is the active ingredient, not the individual. Well, then the adjunctive uh, TFP individual therapy might actually be something that adds added value. Yeah. Can we make a plug for yeah. DBT groups? I think that that could work too, but I think uh, um, Brandon had a very quickly, I was just going to make a plug for MBT groups. So I, I do three MBT groups a week, and so this is a model I'm, I'm very familiar with, and I don't know how it would look different from a TFP group, actually. The two things we're trying to do in an MBT group are, number one, enhance, stabilize the person's mentalizing capacity in the moment, in the heat of active attachment-related experience. And that gets messy, as I think it would equally in a TFP or classical interpersonal group. But there's more top-down structuring by the leaders. So we're trying to actively scaffold the person's mentalizing capacity and then make explicit all of the implicit relational process that's happening. I don't know that you'd get further with that in a TFP modality than you would with MBT. And there is data showing that MBT groups have comparable efficacy to some individual treatments. And that's with the other people in the group? Yeah. In our, in our groups, each patient is asked to talk about their, their individual formulation that they've developed with their individual therapist, present it to the group so that everybody in the group knows each other's implicit relational patterns, and then we're engaging everyone and actually calling each other out, noticing them, mentalizing why they're happening in the moment. It's, it's, it's messy. As an example, we don't have unlimited resources. So we have a DBT group and we have a family connection group. And the condition to go to the group is to have a, a, a therapy, to have a one-on-one -on -one therapy. So I have a colleague who had a, a patient in TFP and she went to the DBT group and that worked, that helped. Uh, and it's better to go to a... Uh, I think in that field, it, you should use the resources you have. We have a DBT group. We use it. Um. So I, I have uh, 1231, so I don't want to, in, in keeping to a frame, which everyone talked about, I, I think we should end uh, almost on time. I want to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, I thought those were really thoughtful, wonderful presentations. And I want to thank you all for attending your questions, too.